You compel me to speak. You are the man. The unclean thing, the dirt that breeds disease. You are the murderer of the murdered king. Twice to my face, you will regret this old man. You sneer at my blindness. You have eyes that cannot see your own corruption. The man you're looking for, the man you cursed and threatened, the murderer of liars, is here. He could see when he came here, he will leave blind. He's a rich man now. He will go as a beggar, groping with a stick in his hand, tapping his way. He will leave this city into endless exile. To his children, whom he loves, he is brother and father. To the woman who bore him, lover and son. To his father, a killer, and the man who supplants him. Go in. Set your genius to solve those riddles. Call me a blind man when you prove them untrue. Hello again, I'm Michael Mountain, and that was an excerpt from the great drama Oedipus the King, which was written about 2,500 years ago by the Greek playwright Sophocles. But what does a piece of ancient Greek tragedy have to do with our screwed-up relationship to our fellow animals, which is what we've been talking about in this whole series of videos? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot, in fact. In this story, the gifted and precocious Oedipus has become king of the city of Thebes after saving the city from disaster by solving the riddle of the Sphinx. But now a plague has struck the city, and the people are appealing to him to save them once again. But he has a big new challenge, since an oracle has said that the plague is the result of deep corruption and will not end until the murderer of the previous king has been found and expelled. Oedipus vows to find the murderer and rid the city of this corruption, and he calls upon the blind prophet Tiresias to help him. But in the scene we just saw, Tiresias tells Oedipus that he himself is the corruption. Oedipus is understandably outraged by the suggestion, but before the day is ended, it will turn out to be true. Oedipus, we learn, has spent much of his life trying to outwit a terrifying prophecy that he would kill his father and marry his mother. He's devoted much of his life to ensuring that the prophecy can never come true, by doing things like leaving his home and his parents and moving to a city far away. But, as the drama unfolds, he begins to see that everything he has done to avoid the prophecy has in fact played right into it, and that for all his gifts and talents he couldn't outfox his fate. Quite the opposite, he's actually brought it about. To the Greeks, killing your father and marrying your mother were crimes against nature. But you can also see the play in part as being about how human civilization itself has become a crime against nature, and how, albeit unwittingly, we humans have become a plague and a corruption upon the whole planet. And however brilliant we might seem to be in solving the riddles of daily life with our medicine and mining and drilling and intensive agriculture and all our other technology, we still cannot solve the fundamental riddle of the human condition, that even as we reach for the stars, the simple reality is that we must end up dust to dust and ashes to ashes, animals who live and die, who eat and are in turn eventually eaten, just like all the other animals. Like Oedipus, we rebel against our fate, 
telling ourselves that we're different from the other animals, exceptional, superior. But the terrible irony is that, like him, everything we have done to outwit our mortal fate has played right into it. Our attempts to take dominion over our fellow animals and to be stewards of the earth have ended up leading to a mass extinction that will likely take us down along with everything else. In Sophocles' great play, Oedipus finally confronts the terrible truth that he himself is the corruption that has brought about the plague that's sweeping the city. And seeing his true blindness, he stabs his eyes out and in the heartbreaking final scene is led away by his two young daughters tap-tapping his way into exile exactly as Tiresias has prophesied. Like Oedipus at the dawn of Western civilization, our reign is coming to an end too. The evidence is all around us. Great die-offs of millions of fish at a time in the poisoned oceans. Melting poles, ever more powerful hurricanes and tornadoes, weather patterns lurching from one extreme to the other, species going extinct by the hundreds and thousands, and now a creeping, growing anxiety in our body politic that something is terribly wrong. There are no easy or high-tech solutions to our situation. The problem lies at the core of our psychology, in the fundamental terror we feel about our own mortal animal nature and the need to take dominion over the other animals and reduce them to the level of commodities as a way of proving our ability to rise above nature itself with its cycles of life and death. But now, like Oedipus, we begin to discover that all we've done is brought calamity upon ourselves. So where do we go from here? Will we go out in our current state of complete denial, blind to the very end, insisting that we're just a few inventions away from saving the planet, curing all disease, making America great again and whatever else? Or, like Oedipus, will we finally have the strength of character to take a deep breath and acknowledge that we ourselves are the problem. We can't save the world at this stage from what we've done, but it's never too late to make our peace with the rest of creation. The animals that we have so horribly abused in the name of human progress. And if we could do that, it would be in the spirit of restitution, of reconciliation, of atonement, a final act of decency and compassion making right whatever we can, however we can, and whatever the cost to ourselves. Albert Einstein wrote that although we humans are part of the whole, we experience ourselves and all our thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest. He called it a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness, and he wrote that our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. And Chief Seattle of the Suquamish tribe famously wrote, What is man without the animals? If all the animals were gone, man would die from a great loneliness of the spirit. For whatever happens to the animals soon happens to man. And that's what is happening. The more we've tried to free ourselves from being animals, the more we've just imprisoned ourselves. Only by truly respecting them can we begin, however late in the day, to find relief from the terror and anxiety that's trapped us ever since. And if we could indeed, even just a few of us, find the strength and decency to do what is right by them, then we would, like Oedipus, have finally solved the riddle of our own nature. Because only by truly respecting our fellow creatures and all of nature can we become free of ourselves and truly part of the proverbial web of life that is the universe.